Chicago, a shining satellite by the lake, known the world over for its culture, cleanliness, and relative calm. In recent years, that calm was shattered by senseless violence perpetrated against its most precious resource, its youth. The Albert beating death focused worldwide attention on the fact that scores of school-age youth in Chicago were the victims of violent crime, even death. The violence left Chicago in shock. Devastated. I, I think um, devastated on a whole lot of different levels. Devastated about the level of violence. Devastated because it impacted not only Deary and Albert, but it impacted the families of those people who were involved, who were ended up being charged with his murder. It impacted the entire Finger school community and everything, every stakeholder surrounding Finger. And I, I think anybody who was here in that district during that time felt that. The escalating violence was felt all the way in the White House. President Obama dispatched Education Secretary Arne Duncan and Attorney General Eric Holder to Chicago to provide federal support to help put an end to the senseless bloodshed. Violence is not a Chicago problem any more than it is a black problem, a white problem, or a Hispanic problem. It is something that affects communities big and small and people of all races and all colors. Money alone will never solve this problem. It's much deeper than that. It's about values and it's about who we are as a society. And it's about taking responsibility for our young people to teach them what they need to know to live side by side and deal with their differences without anger, and without violence. There was conversation even before this thing happened with Darian Albert about what do we do to make our kids safer. It just so happened to be that it, it happened simultaneously. What drove us to this position in the first place? And that was the onset of a high rate of violence that was taking place when CEO Ron Huberman took office. Um, and he was challenged by the mayor to do something immediately. In a dramatic effort to quell the crime chaos, Chicago Public Schools embarked on a trailblazing initiative called the Culture of Calm. At its core, one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Fifty-six was the number that came in in terms of companies that really were responsive to, to wanting to work on this initiative, specifically on the student intervention side. I would say probably about April or May, I think it was, or even March, actually, I think it was, the RFP came out. Um, and a bunch of us around the agency were looking at um, this RFP as, a, as an opportunity for us to serve um, some of Chicago's um, youth who are most in need of, of services, of mentoring services. So from that 56, we were able to identify 23 that were exceptionally strong. You know, we looked and saw what the scope was that CPS was looking to address. And um, from there, we kind of just talked about some of the things that we had been doing over the years that we thought would fit into this particular RFP. And so from that 23, we were able to identify uh, 19 uh, organizations who, who fit the bill and who we were really ready to partner with. Dwayne Chester is an individual that I would say early on in his adolescence uh, was probably misguided and misdirected and so came to the street environment like many uh, students. When I first came to High Park, it was a lot of gangs in there. Hey, I wanted to be popular. You know, I used to gang bang really hard. I used to, you know, shoot at people. For me, making it to Stony, to back across Cottage, you know, I knew that I was going to involve myself with something that's negative. Constantly uh, getting suspended, uh, terrible grades, uh, poor attendance, um, very disrespectful, uh, mouthy. Uh, freshman and sophomore year, I had multiples of suspensions. I can say every time I came off a of suspension, I was going right back on the suspension. I was starting to pick my grades up because I knew my junior year would determine what college I would be accepted to, you know, and it would be the year that I was taking my ACT, you know, SAT and all that stuff like that. But it wasn't until a senior year when he started to implement those thoughts. He's 
really passionate about being a great father. Well, yeah, he really cherishes our money. He loves him to death, so he want to be around for him. And like, right before my grandma had passed, like a couple days before my grandma passed, I had changed my grandma for the first time out of years. And my grandma had been bed bound, like I could say, for like two years. It was a wet diaper. I was like happy about it is because, you know, I knew it was like coming to the end for my grandma, you know, and I wanted to be proud about something that I had did for her. By January, I, I started to notice a, a change in Dwayne's attitude. Um, I would, you know, admonish him for some of the things that he do, had did. And, you know, he'd come back and apologize without being prompted. Or he'd say, you know, I shouldn't have did that. I should have made a better decision. So I would see a, a difference in his grades. He was on the honor roll. Uh, he was coming to school every day uh, and enthusiastic about coming to school because he was working toward a goal finally uh, in his life and he wanted to graduate. I'm with this guy, Jason, my mentor. I'm with him almost every day. I talk to him like every other hour. Jason really did a lot for Lil Wayne. He um, changed him, basically. Cause he like, sometimes Lil Wayne will drift off Jason try to keep him on the right path, show him different things in life, better things, that it ain't all about these streets out here. As I was walking off, they told me, you know, come on, you're going to be locked up, you'll be in charge of salt and battery to a security guard, you know, for pushing them. And, uh, like before my court day, I had wrote the school a letter. He did it reluctantly. Didn't think it was gonna be any uh, gains in his favor for writing the letter. I said, but this will, you will see that this will impact individuals at the school and it did. The judge gave him a lighter sentence. I believe it was uh, 40 hours of community service because the presence of his mentor. And he told him, "Hey, listen to this guy. He uh, he knows a little a little something." He left the courtroom with his cousin Tim, and I told him to go home because every time he hangs around the school, doesn't leave after he's supposed to. Trouble seems to find him. We left there at 2.30, then we made it back around the school area around the time they get out. I was in front of the building or whatever. You know, I had gotten into an altercation with a, with a guy named Jamar. I pushed him. You know, I like put my fist in his face, like shoved him up like this. And like, I was tempting him to swing, but he didn't, but he didn't swing. And then the dean of the school was walking up. So I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm just gonna leave you alone. You know, I ain't even got time for that because they're gonna take my graduation and my prom. So after we had got on the bus and everything, and we was passing Dorchester, coming to Woodline, you know, I had seen the gang of guys standing in front of aid office. And you know, I know these guys don't like us because they affiliated over on this side of cottage and we affiliated on that side of cottage. So as I had came off the bus and everything, you know, my girl was right there. She like, come on, you got a child. Come on, come on, come on, you got a child and everything. And like after that, I had heard the shots go off. You know, and I turned myself like this. You know, he had caught me right here. You know, he had caught me. Cause I had lift, I had lift, lift up. And you know, as the bullet had went in, I had stayed on the floor and I turned around. And as I looked at him, I thought he was gonna get on top of me and start shooting me some more. You know, I thought I was gonna die. I kept, I kept asking the lady, like, man, am I going to die? Am I okay? I'm like, man, I got something to live for. You know, I'm like, man, there's people, I'm like, I'm really trying to change. You know, I haven't been on nothing. I'm really trying to change. I'm like, why did this have to happen to me? After I realized that he was okay and wasn't, and hadn't died at the moment, uh, I was just thinking, I told that boy to go home. And had he been riding with me, I'd have dropped him off at home. Um, so that's what went through my head. Then it was uh, crisis intervention, crisis mode, called the uh, director of the Chicago Ur Urban League, David McCaskill, and all the other administrators that were supposed to report to. So
Hyde Park thought that it would be in the best interest for uh, Dwayne to uh, be homebound schooling. And um, they plan on letting him uh, graduate as well as attend prom. But my graduation is June 13th, and it will start at 1 o'clock. And yes, I will be involved with that. In August of this year, I'm looking forward to attending Langston University, which is in Oklahoma, a HPCU. And uh, I also will be taking on business administration, you know, concentration in marketing major and that. And I tell him all the time, I said, you know, with the business mind that you have, he's very savvy, very personable. I said, you're going to be a CEO of a company one day. The example I want to set for my son is that, you know, don't sit and wait for anybody to give you anything. You know, you got to go out and get it on your own, you know. I want him to be like me, but I don't want him to be like me because I don't want him to make the same mistakes I did. God know that. You know, I'm a good person. He know that I'm trying to change. So he want to see me change and he want to see me be that. You know, he want to see me do good things in my life. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do. You know, I'm trying to be successful. The function of a mentor is really simple. It's to step into the life of a young person where other adults have simply not stepped up to the plate. Mentors wear all hats. They have to be a young person's friend. They have to be a teacher, sometimes a counselor. Um, they have to be a sage. They have to provide advice. And in some cases with the young people in CPS, they have to step into the role of parent. I think that there are some students that actually do find their mentor intrusive and annoying because they're, they're not used to someone all the time being on top of them, wanting to know where they are. But I think having that relationship challenges and disrupts a lot of other negative behavior. It's more annoying to get shot. It's more annoying to have a low paying job for the rest of your life. It's more annoying to not have a sense of your future. And we measure it through some very uh, specific uh, key performance indicators. Attendance, reduction in misconducts, uh, whether or not we've seen any growth academically, uh, how are they responding inside the school environment. So we take all those things into account to determine how's the organization faring, and then we drill down to see how each individual mentor strategy is working with mentees. Culture Com has done is, um, the program has given us some resources to provide after school academic support because our job is to teach. Learning is supposed to be our number one priority, um, but also some enrichment program. One of the outcomes that I could uh, show because everything is uh, driven by data is that our incidences of, of violent behavior um, that we document um, have dropped over, uh, we have over, at this point in the school year, we have uh, over 50% less incidences of violence um, and group five and six, which are the higher level uh, disciplinary violations over the same period of time last school year. That's, that's a huge impact. He's the same as all my other five kids. He just needs more attention. You know, it's been hard since he was in seventh grade, you know, trying to keep him in school. The gangs were around for like about a part of my life. Seventh grade, I got caught into the streets, hanging out a lot with a lot of the guys. And, you know, growing up, they, they show you that they, they have love for you, you you try to show love back, but when the going gets tough, they're not around. Now, kids just kill for nothing. You know, they they have no feelings. To me, it's just, you know, you have a 13-year-old on the street with a gun, and what do you see? You know, they don't have no feelings. During my sophomore year, I was still a demo freshman, and I wasn't turning any work. I was absent in classes. Parents wouldn't be home, and their child would throw a party at their house, and they'll call it a daytime. So we all just leave, go to that kid's house, party during the day, drink, or smoke, or whatever. I had no brothers and sisters in high school to keep me in track, so it was just me by myself. So like, it was basically, I'll do what I want. You know, I pushed him. I had to go to school, you know, and he just didn't wanna, you know, 
you know, he was there, but he wasn't doing his work. Through my senior year, I kind of realized I wasn't going to graduate on time. At that point, I, um, I pray to God, you know, because that's basically, I have faith, I have a lot of faith. I did everything that I could possibly do for him, get him involved in other programs, talking to him, talking to school, you know, going to his, um, there's different people in school and I was just asking for something to happen, somebody to help him. That is my witness that I pray real hard for something to be in my way. I said, give me something I need to find some, some somewhere. And now all of a sudden I got a message on my phone to call that he has been selected to be in this mentoring program. When we first got the referrals from CPS, we had a list of 80 names and Elmo was one of those first referrals. I mean, we had a meeting with everyone, siblings, Maria, Elmo, and it was like a two hour meeting talking about Elmo and his needs and um, a lot of emotion. The family really, really cares about each other. They're really close, and so it was painful for them to see their brother and son going through the things that Elmo was going through. Between me and Lauren, we started getting to know each other more. The relationship got bigger. I have trust in her. She has trust in me. And she was just doing the whole time helping me out, you know, making me realize what was I doing? What was I going after school? What was I spending my time on? Why wasn't I in school? And she kind of like let us let us straight, you know. You're not gonna graduate on time. They told us that he was gonna be there, and they were gonna be there for him. And they were. He was uh, trying to skip school, and his mentor Lauren was there waiting for him outside. They were keeping a close eye on him and, you know, probably in his mind he was probably getting pissed because he couldn't get away no more. Several months after he had begun working with us and he had been doing really, really well, he had actually been working hard in his classes, he had been trying to complete projects, doing his homework, things like that which were really new for Elmo. He had to, he had to drop out of school the next day to register for daily the next week. She found Richard J. Daly, which is a free GED class. Elmo wants to be a fireman really bad. He, um, he says because he likes to help people. And so I, I think it would be beautiful, really amazing to see him be able to do that. But most of all, I think seeing Elmo be a positive contribution to his family and the structure of his family has been an amazing thing. And I, I want to see more of that. I want to see him positively contributing to that and being an example to his younger brother. I have the stuff I'm doing, like I didn't really react and interact with my family. <clears throat> and like, I would felt like I was the outcast, but I started focusing on what I had to do, see my family more often, interact with them. And you know, I'm, I'm knowing who they are, my family. Uh, what brought this change? I don't know, I, I believe it's all the coaching, all the mentoring, all the uh, support that he's been getting, making him realize that his family is the only thing that he has that is truly his. Safe Passage is a community-based program 
where we gather faith-based organizations and community-based organizations to hire people to stand out block to block around our schools to monitor students going back and forth to school on a daily basis. Safe Passage has been an excellent program. Actually, I've been running Safe Passage at Crane High School for four years. Uh, the key to Safe Passage for me is the relationships that you build with Chicago Police Department, CTA. Uh, if you build strong relationships with them, they'll do anything for you. Uh, take for instance, every day at dismissal for the last four years I've had buses waiting for students to leave out, leave out of Crane High School to get on buses, one going east, one going west, which has dramatically reduced the violence and fighting outside of schools. The whole Culture of Calm initiative is funded through uh, a source that was only for a temporary time period. Uh, so we really had to think very hard about how to use the money in a way where we can increase capacity within the building and then also extend our resources out into the community so that the community would come in and kind of reciprocate services and resources. Our ultimate goal is to make sure that these young people are safe. We have a performance management session every month where we bring in all 19 vendors and we look at all the key performance indicators, right, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So students aren't just student ID numbers. Based on the uh, mentorship advocacy program, the community-based vendors now see the Chicago Public Schools in a new light. They see that we're all on the same page trying to get these students educated as well as safe. Uh, Victor is a effervescent, flamboyant student. Um, he's a lot different than many, and he's always eager to learn. Um, I like him in, when he's in class. Overall, he's a pretty good kid. He has had some difficulties growing up. His father died at a young age, so he has been going through a little, little bit of here and there, but he's doing pretty good, I think, overall. I'm gay. Since I came from another school, they didn't accept my sexuality, so I was just like, okay, now I'm in new school, so I'm going to show everybody that I'm me, I'm going to do me till the day I die. When I was in eighth grade, I was gay bashed. When the freshman high school at Gage Park, I was gay bashed twice. They call me fags and um, all kinds of stuff, sissies. And, like, I, they just fought me like I was a piece of nothing. Gage Park was, um, there was a lot of um, violence towards Victor, a lot of hate towards Victor. Um, it just, he didn't have any friends. He was very sad. He didn't I want to go to school. I mean, I was at the school every, probably once or twice a week. Just because of my sexuality being gay, I don't, I don't have, the, I don't have problems with Kelly at all. I go to school, I come home, I can literally like do whatever I want to in Kelly and no one has nothing to say to me. He has a learning disability. A lot of things that he can cannot discuss with me, he discusses with his mentor. They give him guidance. They do take him on field trips. Um, she talks to him. She's got him, you know, making sure that he's going to graduate from high school. You know, the things, positive reinforcement, the same things that I want for my son, they also want for him. Becca fills that very well. And I've talked with her about that. And she, she's had children. She has children of her own. And that's how she approaches the mentoring is more like a mother than a teacher, which is different. Rebecca is she's like my second, like I said, my second mother. She's helped me so she's supported me in any in any search I have. She's told me, she's given me, she's letting me know what's the pros and cons in front of my school what I what I what I have, what I have done or what I'm gonna do. Or. I've been trying to refocus and ask him why he's why is it that um, he hasn't been valuing education at this point and you know yesterday we had a really long conversation about what what it means to value education and what it means to um, come out of what his family has been through
had my own place, I had my own car, I had my own back, I had my own. No one can tell me what to do anymore. I'm okay with it, you know, he needs to grow up. I lived in this apartment and they broke into our house twice already. And one of the times they broke into my house where one of my roommates was home and she scared them out the door. So I said, okay, I'm not letting no one come into my house. And that old enough to okay with you, so I'm gonna carry my There's a lot of distractions for him um, now that he's actually moved out too. It's a little bit more heavy of a responsibility to be working and thinking about all these decisions that he's trying to make. So he's been been distracted a lot. And Dance gives me life. Where I dance everywhere. On the street, in the house, um, at school, anywhere, anywhere I want to, I dance. Um, I've been graduating college. I've did, I probably most likely get my master's degree in dance and did probably a social degree in business, in business management. Um, by then I've graduated, got my own studio, had my own dance studio. I've told him, I don't know if he'll, he might not get it, and, you know, today or tomorrow, but maybe in five years he'll understand what I was really saying to him. And then that's when it's gonna click and he, he's gonna just take off. People were not going to believe the results that we publish, right? It's just inherent. And so recognizing that, we wanted to bring in an outside objective interviewer, if you will, or researcher analysis to make sure that we had in place that perspective that we could both learn from and that would hopefully come to our defense. What I would say is one of the most important weaknesses in the original design of the study of the intervention, which is that the intervention was designed to find individual kids, pluck them, and mentor them one on one. Teenagers work in peer groups, and so you can't just take one individual in the peer group because the statistical analyses from last year told you that this was the kid who had the highest risk of, of being involved in gun violence and then ignore the fact that the kid's in the program. Even if you're the best mentor in the world, you can only mentor them a certain number of hours per week. The kid has to go back to their network and then what happens? And so the many of the organizations found some way of getting around this. I would describe Devonte as an outgoing, happy individual who's always there for everyone. Uh, Devonte Huckleberry is um, actually one of my uh, challenging mentees. And I say that because most of them have the uh, usual issues, uh, maybe gang affiliation, uh, drug abuse, um, broken home, etc. However, Huckleberry, he's more so of a uh, shy kid, um, really standoffish, sometimes withdrawn, uh, pretty bashful, and has the potential to be a great student, but he just lacks that, uh, that, that effort and that little push. So Devante was one of those people that came into class and he was here more to see his friends. Um, he was not always as focused as he should have been. On my freshman year, I was a non-listener, didn't go to class, ditched classes, be in the hall all the time, didn't listen to my teachers, didn't do work. I don't want everybody to be like, he just like his sister, because my sister was a very smart person, well, is a very smart person, and she was very good in school, and I just don't want to be like, he just like his sister and stuff like that. I want to be my own person. Mr. Huckleberry, he's a perfect example of what I mean by that kid. Um, depending on what you place in front of him, he can either be positive or he can either be negative. Huckleberry is a, one of our brighter students in that on the practice ACT, he scored a 17. Um, and our average here is a 15, so he's really making progress. Um, he's really a, a thoughtful kid, he's really um, a mild-mannered kid, but he's a kid that oftentimes misses school 
due to, you know, various reasons. The neighborhood I used to live in, which was 78th and Escanaba, that, that neighborhood was loud. They used to stay having shoots over there. People got killed like down the street from my house. We moved from the other apartment over mainly because of the death of Devante's little brother, and it was like kind of emotional to stay there. Devante's little brother, Chase Sean, Ventrell McMatthew, died June 27th of 2008, the day after his birthday, due to a blow in the chest from his father. Mm. He doesn't really show too much emotion about it. He was the one who found his little brother asleep. We noticed that the majority of our discipline problems came from our young black males. So I really made every effort to um, bring in black males because so many of our students just don't have a father at home. We targeted Devonte as one of the ones who needed a positive real mo role model and he, need, he needed an intensive approach to um, to targeting his behavior and his attendance. Born and raised in Englewood and I can remember as a child just having this embedded in my mind that you know uh, in my neighborhood no one had fathers. It, it was hard for me to deal with as well. And I tell them, and I would just give them pointers how it would help me. I found uh, positive male role models through coaches, through teachers, uh, through counselors, uh, et cetera. What I don't have with my father is that he's never there when I need him. He was never there when I needed him. He was there when everybody else needed him, except for me. And Jonathan's there, yeah. I and mean, he's there to talk to and stuff like that. So this is Hen Studios. You can see over here on the wall over here, these are Grammy nominations that the main engineer Craig Bauer got. If you look at the names, you'll probably see some well, artists see you know. Head. So today was a uh, music careers exploration workshop where our young people got a chance to see some careers behind the scenes that ordinarily aren't the people in front of the camera. Hopefully y'all had a good time, learned a little bit about the music industry, and know there's a lot of jobs besides just being a rapper that can get you paid. My hopes were to give the kids some real life information on the music business coming from somebody that has actually been through what they will have to go through if they want to to take on this industry. I sing and I notice this talent in others. I say from R&B to rap to hip hop to rock and roll to pop, I want to do it all. The program means a lot to me. It has, it has gotten me to five places. It has even gotten me an internship that I ain't going to be doing in the summer. And it means a lot. They helped me get ready for it with uh, interview skills and they took me to get some clothing. He takes Devante on you know, special trips. They go paintball shooting and took him to the Bears game. And Devante loves him. From what I see, Devante loves, his, loves the mentoring program, loves the things that he does for him. I think one of his biggest flaws was confidence. You know, I tell him, hey, you know, uh, no matter what you're going through, you know, you have to endure it. You have to uh, push through, you know, um, whether it be uh, a text in the morning, whether it be um, just giving a shoulder, um, just giving someone to talk to, uh, helping him with uh, hard decisions he needs to make. So just being uh, just a positive uh, influence in his life. First, everything I'm going to say is preliminary. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, strengths. Uh, many, many kids were reached. Many kids were reached, absolutely. And that is a no small feat for this particular population. It's program fatigue, hard to reach anyway. Many of them weren't even in school. Many of them, the schools didn't even know where they were. Uh, 
too, related to that, many of them were reached in a serious way. So it wasn't as if they just signed this piece of paper and then they took off. Many of the kids actually were engaged in the program. Uh, three, trust was built. No question. Not everywhere, not every organization. The organizations varied. But the level of trust that is necessary for the program to work over the long run was built. Many parents started trusting. All the research suggests is that we do more harm than good by intervening in the students' lives for this short period of time and then going away. I think it's been a learning experience for everybody that's been involved in this process working here in safety and security. Um, and I think that if, if really, if you talk to those students who, who've had mentors, they'll tell you that it's making a difference in their lives. And I, I intend to continue whether the MAP program is funded again or not, to continue to have relationships with these students. Um, just because I think part of the problem has been that adults have come in and out of their lives, promised them the world um, for all their lives, and then they look up and these adults are gone. Lindetta would cut, Lindetta would yell and argue with adults, I mean everything. And if she likes you though, she'll tell you, I won't do that to you, Miss Saunders, because I like you. So there was something in her where you knew she knew right or wrong. She was just able to get away with it. She would go to school, she wouldn't go to her classes. She would be there every day and she'd get up and walk out the classroom whenever she felt like it. When I'm getting in trouble, they call me terrorist or they call me lady lunatic. But that's only when I'm in trouble. <laughs> Lindetta was challenging in the beginning. Uh, she wanted to push my buttons. She had her phone out. She would have her little private conversations. Uh, academically, you know, sh she was there. I stayed at Julian more than I stayed at my house. Her mom, uh, at a young age, she, she got on drugs. She was on drugs really, really bad. When Lindetta was born, she was born and she was in foster care. They told me that, I, well, Lindetta's in Indiana and she was like uh, three weeks old. And they said, uh, do you want to come and get her? Because her mom had left her in the hospital. I already had three of her kids. And I said, Lord, I don't want to raise any more kids. I don't. And it was just like something said, well, you are here on this earth for a purpose. And your purpose is, I guess, to raise kids. So I called my, uh, my friend and she said, okay, I'll take you. And we went and got her. And she was sick and I bought her and I've been had her ever since. She's 72 years old and I'm 16 and I done took her through hell and hot water. And she ain't, she ain't had to adopt me when, she ain't had to adopt me. That was her choice, so I just, Thank her, cause she ain't had to do that. She could have just sent me to the um to the foster home and just let me be. Poem is called Abandoned. Sometimes I feel like I'm all alone. No mother, no father, no one to call my own. No longer is my house a home. No friends, no family, so I lost my faith. That's why I feel like I'm abandoned. You lost me somewhere, and that's why I no longer call you mother, I no longer call you father, I just call both of y'all a disgrace. Abandoned, I'm all alone, living with my granny, growing up with no friends and no family. I'm abandoned, I'm lost. Every time I take one step forward, I gotta take 10 steps back. I'm abandoned. It's been extremely difficult for her to come to terms with not having her mother or father around. There's extreme resentment um, that she has regarding um, her parents. Her father lives right across the streets. When I wake up and I walk past my father's house, or if I walk past him, period, and he don't say nothing, I be hurt sometimes, but other times I just shake it off like it don't matter. Uh, it affects me when I get to school different ways. Like, if somebody make me mad, I just, you know, take all that anger out. Like, you know, I just seen my father, he ain't say nothing to me. I feel like it's a shame, because you stay on the same block as your child, you see her every day, and you treat her as if she's a stranger. That it's just so much that go on with her that you just sit back and you, you know, you be grateful for the things that you got going on, but it makes you wanna help her even more so that she understand that, you know, your situation is unique. It's unfortunate, but we can definitely get past this and make this better. I was just at my whip end. 
And then one day she came into the house and she said, Grandma, she said, uh, they have a, I have a mentor at school. I said, you do? She said, yeah. She said, it's like two or three of them because they said I need someone to help manage my anger. I snap when I react to people. When I'm mad, I snap on them or I just, sometimes I walk off. If a mentor are right there, I walk off. When the battle blows up, <laughs> you kind of just let her blow. You take her to a location where she can just scream, yell, do whatever she needs to do, and let her do it. And just listen, just let her vent, just let her get it all out. Because once she get it out, then that's when you can start. So calming her down and then giving her ways to say like, so what do you think we should do with this? What do you want to happen with this? You know, start coming up with solutions together. She understands that what she, whatever the situation was, it was wrong. She understands her actions, but not always fully accepts responsibility for her actions. I ran away like twice, three times I think, to be with my girlfriend, with my ex. When she ran away this year, she called me to pick up and it just so happened she ran away to the west side of Chicago and I actually stay on the west side. So she thought it was going to take somebody hours and minutes to get there. I told her to come outside. I was down the street. When I ran away, I didn't think at the time that I was going to hurt all of them until I got back. And then they was telling me, you know, they was worried and all that. I'm like, dang, I ain't know that y'all cared. I was nervous because I get homesick easily. And I ain't never been gone four days away from my grandma. A lot of our kids have never been outside that neighborhood, even if the travel, travel downtown. It's something new to them. So for us to be able to take them maybe two hours, three hours south and, and show them uh, black students that's actually working on you know, furthering their education, I think that's gonna be powerful. College is important to me because I wanna be something in life. I wanna be a journalist because I love to write and I wanna be a homicide detective. When my cousin got killed my eighth grade year, and I felt like there was, you know, something still missing. But because Culture of Calm has things in place that can kind of get to those kids and put them into places where they can talk to people, stay on them about going to class, she's really done a complete turnaround. To one of them have did the greatest thing for her. And it's like she had a turnaround when she started to go into the center. And, she, uh, and, and it's, it's the truth. Feeling that this year, she more calm, relaxed, respectful, quiet, nice, observant. More quiet and observant and stuff and nice because I see that, you know, it's more than people that, than my grandma that, you know, actually care about me, that actually gonna take the time to see what's wrong with me. I'm hoping that it, it's been um, the positive influences in her life. I'm hoping that it's been, I'm getting older, and I can't continue down this path. I'm hoping that she understands that those actions are only gonna lead her down a negative path. How have we built the capacity for the organizations to continue doing this kind of work on their own? I think that's a critical piece and where a lot of our focus needs to be. If there isn't uh, a huge resource to exist, does that mean the need goes away? Absolutely not. So we need to be challenging ourselves to how do we make sure that the services that our students need continue and not let the uh, uh, budget deficit and the issues around funding really constrain what we can do creatively and innovatively to make sure that we take the lessons learned, the best practices, the infrastructure, the trust that we built, and make sure that it continues to result in students being serviced, because that's really what this is all about. If you're thinking in terms of funding issues, especially in the current situation, the first thing you're thinking about is very easy, clear markers, simple measures of success, and so on. I mean, it should, of course makes sense, but the problem is that if you do that, and if you don't keep in mind the complicated lives the kids lead, the complicated kind of program this has to be over time, meaning a program in which the mentor if I'm your mentor, I'm listening to you, I'm trying to be a good role model for you, I'm trying to get you engaged in the system, but I also have to keep an eye out for, do you need help in homeless services? Does this look like somebody who also needs maybe some assistance? Are there maybe HIV AIDS issues that you have to deal with? Are you coming out as gay? 
Who's talking to you about that? Are there resources separate from this one on one vision? Are you in a gang? Did your best friend get killed in a gang? Did your mother get sent to rehab? Right? I mean, it's that people are living complex lives. We may just want to address one thing, but for this particular population, we have to think about it holistically. Also, look at how the organizations have grown, how the schools have grown, the, what you've learned in providing supports for these students. Because you've essentially established a blueprint, if you will, for what effective mentoring looks like. What happens to a city when 50% of its children don't graduate high school? What happens to that city? How does that city exist into the future? That every student we can save from this path toward the corner or the grave or jail um, into the path of productive citizen, you know, a dollar spent today saves a thousand dollars five years from now. My name is Maria Silva and I'm here to um, uh, just give you a little story. Oh, sorry, pull the mic. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> That's okay, just take I'm your time. I'm a mother of um, of a kid of, out of Kelly High School. And um, through the last three years, my son was uh, having issues with the academic, plus getting involved with bad uh, relationship with gang members and and um, having a lot of issues. And um, sad to say, he, was, uh, he spent three years and only had three credits in high school. So I was ready to uh, give up, you know, ready to throw the towel and say, you know what, I give up. Um, unfortunately, I got a call from a mentoring program called MAP, and um, I said my prayers have been answered. You know, they, they show me hope, and my son has made a tremendous change in his life. He's, um, has changed totally, and I don't have enough words to say thank you to the program, to my, this is my son's mentor, uh, Lauren, and um, I can, you know, my, I'm here just to show the support and to keep the program going. Giving voice to the impact on an individual that that allocation of resources had, and the individual was your son. So if, if we've had any part in that process, um, we are grateful for your coming today and sharing with us your individual um, experience. Um, there is a, uh, some ongoing financial challenges, so please have others continue to inform the board so that they know of the value of those kinds of programs going forward. Just fall, disappear Scarred up on my body from the past year Watching my city go down so tragic This a bloody shame Them people never change They let my guy shot down, man, without his brain That's why with them gangs I never claim Never bang, dead the jail, it's the same My friends did them classes just to flick them ashes I'm in the back class learning all the mathematics That's why when I get it, don't call me hit man Damn, I don't feel it like Tony I want the world and everything in it They said I couldn't have it, so I had to go steal it My fam is dependent all on me I'm so blessed, thanks G.O.D. In a situation where you couldn't escape it Mama was a drunk, daddy a Freemason Heart full of hatred, souls for the taking 
How come we don't fear God, but we scared of Satan? But we gotta face it, hard to erase it. Codification, no man arrange it. Then it all track us hard, a collaboration. How come they still racist? How come they still hate us? It's a shame black folks still hate each other. That's why the work man wrote the Willie Lynch letter. That's why I'm out here trying to get it in the worst weather. That's why the kids gang bang, we don't know no better. See, look, man, I'm trying to live a dream, but dreams turn into knees, and knees turn into things, and things turn into schemes. But every man bleeds, little gristle in their bodies, cause they had no self esteem. I'm 18 now, and I'm kicked out of high school. My mind is so abused, the choices that I choose, you snooze, you lose. So I don't know what to do, so I grab my pen and paper. It's time to get lyrical. So keep your head up, I know what you're going through. Just get right with God, and man, I promise you, you will never make it out here on your own. Thou who live without seeing, so catch the first stone.